Good evening, everyone. We'll wait just a minute for all the attendees to join us, and then we'll get started on our event this evening. Well, good evening. My name is Amenta Awesome, and I'm a clinical instructor at the Harvard International Human Rights Clinic. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this second in a series of events that we've been convening on racial justice and human rights here at Harvard Law School. And I'll serve as the moderator for today's event, uh, which is entitled Human Rights, Civil Rights, and the Struggle for Racial Justice. And the event aims to highlight the work of advocates who are using local and global tools to advance racial justice. Um, before starting, I want to thank all the organizations that agreed to co-sponsor this event today and who have helped us really spread um, the word about it. In particular, the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice, um, the HLS Advocates for Human Rights Student Practice Organization, the Harvard Human Rights Journal, and the Harvard Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Law Journal. So thanks so much to our co-sponsors. And I'm happy to be able to facilitate this conversation between three incredible lawyers who have used um, human rights to advocate for racial justice, both nationally and internationally. Um, in no particular order, we're joined by Nicole Austin Hillary, who's executive director of the US program at Human Rights Watch. Um, at HRW, Nicole leads work aimed at ending rights violations that are linked to abusive systems in the United States. And that includes advocacy to combat systemic racism. Um, we're also joined by Miriam Jordan, who is counsel for the Special Litigation and Advocacy Project of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, where she supports legal and advocacy strategies to advance racial justice. We are happy to claim her as a Harvard Law School graduate and a graduate of our clinic um, from the class of 2014. Um, and last but not least um, is Gay McDougall, who is distinguished scholar in residence at the Leitner Center for International Law and Justice at Fordham Law School. Um, many people will know that Gay has devoted her career to advancing racial equality in the US and around the world. Um, notably, she was the former vice chair of the UN Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination and served as the first UN Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues. So thanks to all three incredible panelists for, for sharing your work and your wisdom today with us. So the format of today's conversation will be a moderated discussion. So I'll start off with a few questions and then we'll turn to the questions from those of you who are following along virtually. Um, for those who are following along, we ask you to submit your questions in the Zoom Q&A function um, and we'll do our best to incorporate as many of those as possible into the conversation. So to get things started, in light of the fact that we're celebrating Black History Month, or one of 12 Black History Months for those of us who celebrate all year, I would like to start off with a question that reflects on the tradition of this work and how strong that tradition is. Um, we know, for example, that human rights advocates have used international human rights law and language to push for racial justice in the US as far back as 1940s. Uh, one example of this is the Appeal to the World petition that W.E.B. Du Bois and the NAACP sent um, on behalf of African Americans whose rights were being violated um, shortly before the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, another example in that sphere is the activism of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which in the early 1960s engaged with UN human rights experts who were visiting um, different countries around the world to study racial discrimination, including um, a visit to Atlanta. And so I want to address this question to one of the panelists who is actually from Atlanta, and that is Gay McDougall, and to ask her if, um, what do you think, Gay, about the legacy of this type of advocacy, and are there sort of um, moments and initiatives that we can point to today that you, that you draw back to this history? Well, I mean, uh, first of all, I draw the history further back to the <laughs> um, anti-slavery movement um, and the appeal that uh, uh, was made consistently to uh, the international uh, community for relief from anti from slavery at that time. But I, I, I want to uh, be uh, um, in all humility, I guess. <laughs> 
I want to uh, offer that I was very much inspired uh, by these uh, pioneers and consistently sort of modeled my career or tried to uh, after their example, starting um, as early as the uh, 1970s, uh, when I worked with the UN uh, Special Committee Against Apartheid and tried to link uh, the situation of political prisoners in South Africa with political prisoners in the US. Um, and um, also sort of uh, tried to, and did uh, really travel uh, the country under the guise of the National Conference of Black Lawyers to involve activist Black lawyers in understanding that link and as sort of acting uh, on it. Um, and, um, you know, it was um, a hard take on the issues, if I would say, <laughs> primarily by uh, the UN, but not so much by uh, activist lawyers uh, around uh, the United States. Um, I also, uh, you know, tried to do my own petition to the UN early on uh, that I got uh, the signatures on uh, from all of the heads of human rights, uh, civil rights, sorry, organizations in this country and got them to accompany me uh, to the UN to uh, file it in the name of commemorating the W.B. Du Bois um, uh, initial uh, petition. And I sort of started a project to make those linkages uh, between, you know, what was happening here and around the world and uh, also uh, uh, in the UN. It was, uh, I would say, a very difficult linkage to make uh, with the traditional civil rights workers, uh, lawyers, for reasons we could talk about. Uh, but it was not as difficult to make, I eventually understood, uh, for sort of grassroots uh, organizations throughout the US that I made contact with and started working with. Um, they found it just the thing that they needed uh, as an additive to mobilize um, um, their uh, work. And so that was very instructive. I, I started a project just in 1995 that just tried to uh, do this. And I think it uh, then morphed at some point into the U.S. Human Rights uh, Network. Uh, but um, I would uh, say that there are two lessons that I learned from doing this work consistently. And one was that focus uh, on groups that do grassroots work uh, at, as a mobilization. Uh, for them and their work. And I, you know, no problem there, big guy. And number two, you know, the other thing that was a, a, a significant mobilizer across the board was the work I did with the Durban World Conference on Human Rights. Um, and uh, I was able to, uh, uh, with the gracious funding of Ford Foundation, of course, uh, be able to bring civil society groups uh, from across this country, uh, along with uh, in other countries as well, uh, to Durban to see how um, potent these ideas are in the rest of the world and to join in uh, with that. Um, and um, I got, um, you know, the top uh, people from every civil rights organization, traditional civil rights organization, and many of the other organizations throughout uh, the country to come. And it was that experience that led uh, Wade Henderson to change the name of the um, organization that he led at that time uh, from 
civil rights to civil rights and human rights, mm -hmm. uh, making uh, a nod uh, uh, in that uh, uh, direction. But, you know, the bottom line is that I've tried to make um, these connections as the real center of the work that um, I have done uh, over the years. And I think that there have been some very good successes in that. Thanks so much, Gray. I wonder if the other panelists also find themselves or find inspiration in some of the, the examples that were given. Um, and I think I'm taking out of that as well, this idea of being the linkages between the work that's being done in the US and the, and the, you know, the passion for pursuing justice by, by many communities and grassroots organizations around the world. Um, one question that I think we often get is sometimes a theoretical question of whether human rights and civil rights are two different things. So maybe I'll just pass it to Nicole to, to respond to, to some of those um, thoughts. Sure, and I'm so glad you brought this up. And, and Gay actually laid the groundwork for this part of the conversation. Look, I tell people all of the time, if you talk about human rights and civil rights as being separate buckets, you're missing the mark. Inextricably linked. One is an outgrowth of the other. And in fact, when you read through the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and some of the other international treaties, you will see very clearly that so many of the issues that we consider civil rights in the United States are covered there. In fact, just through, during the past election, we at Human Rights Watch wrote a report talking about the human right to uh, and how, and how that installation and <laughs> that's okay. That, I love Zoom, I love technology, <laughs> I'll keep it rolling. But as I was saying, we just did a report in November that talked about the right to vote and how that is inherently guaranteed and spelled out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So you can't really talk about civil rights and human rights without understanding that when we talk about housing, when we talk about a right to housing, when we talk about a right to education, when we talk about a right to be free from discrimination, those are civil rights and human rights issues. And if we really want to conquer these problems, if we really want to try to bring about real justice, ec racial equity, we have to start addressing the issues through this combined and bilateral lens or else we are missing the mark. There is hmm. more power in using the tools from both the civil rights and human rights histories and the tools that are in both arsenals in order for us to attack these issues. And that's what we see happening. That's what we see emerging over this, this past year. When George Floyd was murdered, we didn't just see people in the United States rising up in the streets. We saw a trans-global movement. And that's because the language of human rights and civil rights is universal. And so we have to start talking about it that way. In fact, we have to start mobilizing that way. Thanks so much, Nicole. Yeah, the language of civil rights is universal as well. That's that's a really important point that is often missed. Um, any other, I wonder if there are any other comments on this point, and I, if not, I would carry on from the idea of talking about the George Floyd protests because I know that inspired a lot of um, activism around the world. And um, we know, for example, in the US that that's now estimated to be one of the largest protest movements in in US history. Um, so I'm curious, maybe Gay, I'll ask you about this. Um, now that we've seen a lot of passion and a lot of mobilization in countries around the world, I'm wondering what the reaction has been internationally among governments in particular and how have they, how, res how responsive have they been from, from the calls for accountability and, and, um, and systemic reform? Oh, I think it's muted. Enter uh, this. I was uh, just completing my term as vice president um, of the UN Committee Against Racism. Uh, when this happened, and it allowed me to play an insider outsider uh, role, uh, which was, uh, I think, 
uh, useful in demanding uh, accountability uh, from the UN. Um, I worked with Jamil Dakwa, the ACLU, to draft a letter urging the UN uh, Human Rights Council to take an unprecedented step, uh, which was to hold a special uh, a special session uh, of the council that hopefully would lead to authorizing a uh, commission of inquiry by the UN into uh, these matters in the US. And, um, you know, in a, we drafted the letter and then in 24 to 30 hours, uh, the uh, US Human Rights Network got something like uh, 700 uh, sign-ons for the letter of organizations in the US and around the world. And uh, this then we presented to the UN and I was able to get the South African ambassador uh, to uh, lead the charge inside the council, uh, which she willingly did. Um, and just to cut along the story uh, short, the result uh, was that we got something that was less than we asked for, made it as usual, uh, but necessary, but nevertheless unprecedented in that we got a special debate, um, which led to a decision to have a report written by the High Commissioner for Human mm -hmm. Rights on these questions. What has happened in the racialized policing? What about uh, the history of structural racism in the US? Uh, and that report is to be presented in, um, in June or July. Um, now, I just want to make two points, a couple of ones. <laughs> one is, why uh, did we not get the whole Monty, as it were? Uh, the reason uh, was that um, uh, the US mission the U.S. government, uh, State Department, et cetera, proceeded to lobby uh, all of the governments involved in the council, uh, lobby them in their capitals. Uh, the, I should not use the word lobby, I mean bully them, uh, to uh, say, look, if you want to have our name, the United States, in a resolution such as this, uh, then uh, your aid package is going to be in jeopardy. And by the way, you ambassador there that's taking this into the room to negotiate, you won't have this job next year. Now, I would say this is at the least distasteful, but <clears throat> it means that two things. First of all, we got unbelievable support around the world for this issue, but also it set off, um, you know, protests against the issues that faced communities there at home that were so much like it, like the anti-SARS in, in Nigeria, uh, like the police killings of black youth on the streets in Brazil, et cetera. Um, and so there was resonance there that was uh, very important. Uh, secondly, we didn't get what we wanted because of the U.S. bullying. And that we have to address as citizens of the U.S. So we have to address it uh, for our sakes and for the sake of other uh, people in other countries. Um, and Third, we got an unprecedented response from inside the UN. Uh, I mean, these sort of international civil servants that don't real, you know, they're not supposed to be real people. <laughs> <laughs> but they, their position was, look, we got to do something to support uh, these people that say that we are outraged uh, against George Floyd and actually also 
to say that we are subject to racial discrimination within the U.S. Mm -hmm. and we would like to have that addressed as well. Mm -hmm. So it was, it's been an incredible, um, you know, experience as, as, as still reverberations are, you know, sounding inside the U.N. and uh, uh, globally. But it means that we have to um, we have to be attentive to the issue of solidarity, uh, which is not always in our minds. And often we go for what serves us as Americans in the first place. And I say this as civil society, you know. Um, we have to be seen to be supporting the issues that people in other countries uh, face as well. And uh, the other thing is that, look, you know, the UN is a, in the first instance, it's a club of governments. Um, and um, we can only get so much out of it. Uh, you know, as I would go around the world speaking to oppressed uh, groups in various countries as the specter of the tour, you know, I would always say, look, I'm here to hear what you have to say, but I want to be honest with you. The UN is not coming to save you. <laughs> now that, you know, uh, uh, the UN can help you uh, in important ways. Uh, but uh, you have to be your own liberator. Mm -hmm. And we have to take that to heart ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's very important. And I actually, I'm thinking too about this, the idea of what are the benefits of international human rights? And I think we often miss the idea of solidarity. We think of very formal things, formal tools that we can use and and not, you know, something as powerful as solidarity. Um, I, I want to turn it to Miriam to give you a shot to jump in here. I, I'm wondering from your experience, what do you see as some of the benefits of, of pushing for human rights or pushing for racial justice as a human rights issue? And if you, if you, you know, have a perspective on any areas of limitation or change that those of us who are in the human rights community should should consider for um, for um, in order to make the struggle against racial justice more uh, more effective. Definitely, but uh, before I answer your question, I actually just wanted to piggyback off of something that Gay had mentioned in terms of solidarity and kind of showing common experiences with uh, in what's occurring in the U.S. and elsewhere. Um, so before I started working at Lawyers Committee, I had done some international human rights work in South America, and I had done some work with grassroots organizations and indigenous and Afro-Latino communities. And just in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder, it was incredible to see on social media, you know, how local activists were, you know, really following what was going on in the U.S., but also, you know, I guess, identifying, you know, unfortunately, you know, common patterns of human rights violations, especially with the police brutality, but also the aftermath with the way uh, the police responded to protesters and the fact that I think, you know, a lot of times when you think about violence against protesters in the human rights space, I think often a lot of people think about what is happening in, you know, other countries, but, you know, unfortunately, just the parallels you see between violence here and elsewhere, I think is, is very striking. And I think, you know, it, it shows more opportunities for, you know, some sort of international collaboration, established of, establishment of solidarity. Uh, jumping back to your question, Aminta, I think that for me, going from a, a space where you could use international human rights norms and laws more easily and in terms of legal advocacy to relying on US federal courts is definitely a, a lot of frustrations. And so uh, as you know Nicole pointed out, a lot of these principles of you know how we view racial justice in the United States, you know, has this important connection to human rights and what are considered universal inalienable rights that we are all granted. 
but actually trying to accomplish that and getting a legal court to recognize that here is extremely challenging. I think especially, you know, when you think about the concept of being, you know, the human rights norm of being free from racial discrimination, you know, while that seems like that should be a very, you know, broad thing that's accepted, you know, I think a lot of us are aware that in the United States, it's much more complicated and the way courts have, you know, treated this concept of racial discrimination under domestic law is basically is evolved to the point where, you know, they've created a lot of barriers such as, you know, let's say you've experienced racial discrimination, a lot of times you have to show intentional discrimination. In order to show intentional discrimination, you have to have all types of evidence or establish certain factors, and it's just more increased barriers. Or, you know, I think it's kind of evolved to a point where certain types of racism on the part of the government is acceptable, but, you know, as if you can show that the government would have taken the same action if race hadn't been a factor, it's, um, it's technically allowed, um, in, you know, certain legal contexts. And so just seeing how these barriers are increasing, and I think, you know, unfortunately, given the context of the courts, we may see, you know, more efforts to make the burden of those who experience race discrimination uh, more difficult uh, in terms of getting some sort of legal remedy. I think this really shows the importance of trying to, you know, look at international human rights norms as kind of the ultimate goal when we think about how we can improve uh, rectifying racial discrimination in the United States and what, you know, should be considered acceptable or unacceptable. And I think besides this concept of, you know, how you get, you know, a challenge race discrimination in U.S. courts, it's also thinking about other ways in which racism permeates, such as you know, access to basic rights, such as housing or water, education. You know, in human rights norms, these are basic rights. A lot of countries have constitutions where you have a constitutional right to housing, to education, to clean water, the environment, et cetera. We don't have that here. And so I think this is also another challenge in which the way the US constitution, which, you know, was written way before we had these accepted international human rights norms and that kind of being used to, you know, frame how we view certain rights in the U.S. that should be, you know, automatically acceptable or, you know, when you think about, I guess, how you're, you know, framing some sort of discrimination in a way that's um, going to be appealing to a court here. And so when you have certain situations like how communities of color may, you know, be facing, you know, access to water issues or, you know, unfair access to education. The fact that we can't just say, well, you know, this is a basic human right um, is something that I think is also just very frustrating, but also I think shows the importance of how norms, international human rights norms need to be incorporated in domestic law. And I think recognized more so when we think about potential causes of action. Thank you. I jump in with one one other thing too. I, I completely, I, I was saying my my head, um, Miriam, my amens um, <laughs> who are speaking. Um, I, I, I wanna say one other thing about the solidarity issue, which, you, which Gail opened up and Miriam commented on, because I think this is not talked about enough and, and we have to be truth tellers when we have these conversations. Solidarity is not just about having solidarity with other communities of color trans globally. It's also about having solidarity within our human and civil rights communities, regardless of what your areas of expertise are. You know, I, I, I continue to be frustrated by people being trapped in silos, you know, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes I'll have conversations where people will say, well, I'm an expert in women's rights. Mm -hmm. I'm an expert in LGBTQ rights, or I'm an expert in education. Race, particularly in the United States, undergirds all of those issues. Mm -hmm. What your area of expertise is, race is at the heart of it. If you're talking about being a voting rights expert or if you're talking about being a housing expert, if you look at so many of the wrongs that we fight back against in our court systems here, it is because race, racial injustice is at the heart of so many of those ills. So we have to also break down those barriers and develop solidarity within our groups as well. 
um, so that people stop saying, you know, I only do this, that's, that's not my bailiwick. We have to understand that again, we gain strength when there is solidarity among experts and among the issue areas because race is the connective tissue for all of it. Absolutely. The other thing that I was thinking about too is that um, a lot of times we hear people say like, I'm an international human rights expert and that naturally means I work out there somewhere. Um, <laughs> and the point was made about universality. If this is a universal framework, it applies to us and we have to be also self-critical and self-reflective about what's going on in the US. Human rights applies to us. And um, one thing that I think about too, I mean, never was that more apparent than a month ago when we had the violent attack on the US Capitol. A lot of people said like, this is what we see elsewhere. No, this is what we see here actually. Um, and that echoed a lot of instances in my mind uh, thinking of reconstruction and the backlash against reconstruction, um, times where violent intimidation was a backlash against racial progress in the US. Um, and I'm wondering, Nicole, because I know that you have done some work on this, how you felt about that event and, and what you were thinking, you know, in terms of these communities of, of practitioners who are pushing for racial justice, what kind of tools can we use um, from our own frameworks, from the civil rights communities and international human rights, so to speak, lawyers um, that we can we can use in response to this this type of violent intimidation? Well, first, let me say, like everyone, I was thinking if these were black bodies going up those steps. <laughs> And I live in Washington, I, mm -hmm. you know, I'm in the DMV, I'm in the, the, the Washington suburbs. We all know there would have been bloodshed that day. Mm -hmm. um, there, the responses would have been different. The, the preparation would have been different. And you know, one of the things I continue to say that day is that people, the people who were in charge could not see themselves in, in, those, in those people or at least what they saw were people who were like them and they couldn't envision them being insurrectionists. They couldn't envision them being people who were wreaking havoc and chaos and bringing violence to the Capitol. And that's one of the issues that, that we have to get beyond. And that's one of the things that I focused on that day and we're continuing within my program to focus on beyond that, 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 that whole privilege, the whole white concept of white privilege, what that means and how that doesn't allow you, even when you are in a position of law enforcement, um, it doesn't allow you to see beyond your whiteness to understand that people who look like you are capable of these things. Um, and that's something that we have to get beyond. The other thing that I continue to focus on throughout that day and we are focusing on now is the whole issue of accountability. Um, it's one thing for that kind of madness to have happened. Another thing for us to then talk about how are we going to deal with it? Deal with it. How are we going to address it? Um, and I continue to, I, I have to say, I continue to see streams of white privilege showing up even in how our justice system is dealing with these individuals. Hmm. Um, and, you know, we have to start speaking out about what accountability looks like, what our expectations for accountability are, uh, because, you know, and we have to be careful also in terms of what we ask for, because we know sometimes when we point out what's wrong and we start talking about what tools need to be used to fix it, oftentimes those tools are turned around and they're used against the same black and brown people that we are working to protect, the disenfranchised people, um, the discounted people that we are trying to protect. So we have to be very careful with that, but we have to ensure that we are demanding demanding that our justice system respond to those actions and treat those people and hold them accountable in the ways in which our laws will allow. And the third thing I'm into, and you mentioned this earlier, we have to get out of this, um, what we sometimes call it at Human Rights Watch, American exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. Thinking that, oh my gosh, how could this happen here? Mm -hmm. This can happen here, just like it happens in other parts of the world. You know, we all we all are closely watching what's going on in Myanmar, mm -hmm. and you know, when that when that broke out, I thought there there but for the grace of God, mm -hmm. we 
have had a situation like that here in the United States. So getting out of thinking about ourselves as, as exceptional and start understanding that we are humanists and we all people and the same kinds of situations that happen in other parts of the world could very much happen here if we are not doing what we can to protect and uphold democracy. That I think is part and parcel of what we have to be doing in order to move human rights and civil rights forward and protect the rights of people. And, and I might say, if I could just jump in here, it's not that it could happen. It's happened here over and over and over again. Hmm. Um, you know, and uh, every time uh, we make one step forward, uh, there is a violent uh, blowback hmm. that is used to justify the next period of go slow. Hmm. So, you know, it is, uh, this is not something that is new or unprecedented mm -hmm. in U.S. history. Um, and it shouldn't be held as uh, separate uh, from the question of, uh, you know, uh, black, um, black Lives Matter and mm -hmm. protests and demands uh, for accountability. This is blowback. Mm -hmm. And what Trump has done uh, is enable it mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, fuel uh, it. But make no mistake, uh, it's about us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I might say that, you know, it's been interesting in the context of the work we've been trying to do with the High Commissioner for Human Rights who's doing this report on uh, you know, racialized policing um, and uh, structural uh, racism. It is, um, it's a lesson for the High Commissioner, you know, coming at, uh, at uh, an interesting point, uh, a lesson in how deeply rooted um, you know, structural racism is in the U.S. society mm -hmm. and why progress uh, is always being stalled. It's not that it hasn't been tried before, mm -hmm. it's just always stalled by this kind of violent overreaction. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is an important lesson about uh, the situation of uh, or the, the, the nature of racism in this country. Yeah, definitely. So this event is not, you know, the US is not exceptional and the event is not exceptional either. Um, I saw a, a comment, actually a question from one of the um, audience members who was asking something about along the lines of the Capitol attack. She asked if we can talk about the US discourse on domestic terrorism in, in the wake of the attack and also um, after 9-11. How can thinking about these um, violence as domestic terrorism affect our ability to make change, she's asking. And if the panelists could speak to the discourse on terrorism in terms of mobilizing for racial justice um, in a with with in a rights respecting way. Um. Mariam or Nicole? Yeah. I was going to say, I got something Go to say. for it. Go Miriam, for it. Miriam, you know Gay and I will keep going, so you better. <laughs> so go ahead, Miriam. <laughs> oh, making me feel like I'm in a law school class. <laughs> I mean, I think that one thing that I, I think comes to mind is kind of more of a cautionary kind of perspective on how we use, you know, domestic terrorism laws. And, you know, just going back when I'm thinking about, you know, the human rights implications of this, you know, my experiences with working with communities in other countries and how domestic terrorism laws were abused in a way to, you know, retaliate against activists and grassroots mm -hmm. organizations, you know, a, you know, a form of repression. And so, you know, on the one hand, you know, we want to be expansive and, and, you know, how we, you know, view, you know, certain conduct that is, you know, oppressive, you know, 
is, you know, especially, you know, what happened at the Capitol or, you know, domestic terror against black and brown bodies. But I think it's, you know, it's a balancing act, you know, we want to recognize the seriousness of these types of crimes, but also we do not want a framework in which, you know, something that on paper sounds like it could be protective of communities is also used against the communities that people have in mind where we're thinking about who we are trying to protect. And so I think that's kind of where I'm coming at it right at this moment. Great. Any other reactions to that, to that question? Sure. Gay, Gay, what do you think? Well, you know, I think that uh, got a series of disconnected thoughts, but uh, one is uh, that uh, this country will use that term terrorism, which has become a sort of convenient hook that the expectation is that there's no questioning of the core of that concept, mm -hmm. you know? So if you label it terrorism, everybody says, oh yeah, and walks away. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one, that, th it, that this notion of terrorism is not sufficiently interrogated uh, by um, us mm -hmm. or uh, the government. Um, and it's clear that around the world, not just in, in the US, but the US has, has, has given cover to countries around the world to use this label uh, of terrorism to uh, cover up its actions against political dissidents that have real issues uh, of legitimacy uh, to race um, in, in their countries and maybe in others. Um, so that's that's one thing that it is, um, yeah, used as, as as a cover for oppression or repression um, uh, against uh, uh, dissidents. Um, but I, you know, I would end with this point, which is, look, you know, the FBI has been telling uh, the government and everybody else that the real terrorists are domestic terrorists, uh, not foreign terrorists of whatever uh, measure you may paint it. But really, the serious problem is in this country. And, you know, as I have, uh, you know, I grew up in the South, mm -hmm. Jim Crow South. And so it doesn't take much to convince me that all those people that I saw march into Stone Mountain to light up their crosses and their hoods and all were terrorists mm -hmm. um, that uh, were really the ones that were threats uh, to me uh, and my community. But uh, the country, even after the, the, the Civil War, uh, felt that uh, there should be some amends made with them. And that uh, after all, we're all brothers, even though we were part of issue one. Well, come on, brother, let's be, the, you know, which enabled them to, uh, to uh, continue uh, with their, uh, well, with their uh, repression of uh, Black communities in the South, you know, which led into the Jim Crow era. Um, and even beyond. So, you know, I think that uh, the, um, the tune that's been danced by this government throughout the ages has been, look, you know, if they're white, we can find a way to, you know, make a, accommodation with them. You know, but if they're brown, especially if they're brown from another country or whatever, or if they're uh, the Black Power Movement people, uh, then uh, we use this label to crush them and crush, you know, uh, hard. Uh, that's what it means to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, and Aminta, you know, I don't think the concern right now with respect to domestic terrorism is that we need more rules and regulations. We need to have the rules and regulations that we currently have available to us used correctly. 
you know, our research at Human Rights Watch has shown that there has been far too little focus by our national law enforcement on the activities of so-called white nationalists. They have not been interrogating those groups, following those groups, keeping data on those groups in the ways in which they should, given the history of those groups, given evidence that is available regarding some of the activities of those groups. That's what has to happen. And that goes back to the point I made earlier when you asked the initial question about the sixth. The majority of people who are in charge of law enforcement in this country are white people. They have to break down, get rid of the implicit bias that exists in favor of white people and start understanding and seeing that people who look just like them have these capabilities and do have these histories and have to be monitored and have to be interrogated and watched and be brought in front of courts and dealt with accordingly, um, just as any other group about which we have concerns with respect to terrorism. That's what needs to happen. And that's not what's been happening. Um, mm -hmm. And we have to start looking at white nationalism and the issue of white nationalism as the threat that it is. Mm -hmm. And we haven't done that. Mm -hmm. Very important points. And I'm actually thinking too about another question that came in from the audience, which is about um, trust. And I think that it speaks to what you know, everyone's kind of reacting to. I mean, communities that have been oppressed, they see things in a different way. They know the ramifications of expansion of um, terrorism laws and what that impact can have on those communities. But they also see the events in a different way because they are familiar with that kind of, um, that kind of oppression. Um, one question was about specifically about law enforcement and maybe the panelists who, who've worked in the area of uh, criminal justice and criminal justice reform would want to speak to this. And the question was, what could police and law enforcement do to create more trust between um, themselves and communities of color? And I'm actually wondering whether there's something that lawyers who are in this space can do to, to um, to um, bring more awareness to law enforcement about the needs of communities. You know, I mean, I, I, I must say, and I, I said this uh, repeatedly with respect to the George uh, Floyd murder and the gazillion of webinars and whatever mm -hmm. afterwards that um, and I've tried to uh, make this point hard to the High Commissioner with respect to her upcoming uh, report. The issue to me is not an issue of policing and policing reform. The issue is racism mm -hmm. and how racism has impacted both the Black and the white communities uh, throughout uh, the various eras. Uh, when I look at the, um, you know, the tape, uh, that horrible tape of uh, George Floyd being uh, slowly killed by this policeman with his knee on his neck, I asked my students to think about two problems there. Look at George Floyd. How did he get there? And there's a hell, you know, there are uh, years of thinking about what brought him to that point. Mm -hmm. But the other problem there is, look at the face of that policeman who is callously crushing the life out of him. Those same years have brought him to where he is mm -hmm. to be able to do that. And, you know, I, um, that's why I think that, that, that you know, the, the tendency that we have after situations like this is to talk odd and benighted about police reform. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, I, I, I just don't think that that's the problem here. Uh, they're not that the police that they're not a lot of reforms that could be made. Uh, we probably all 
on this panel and you also <laughs> rattle off every one of them that would uh, make sense. But then you got to ask yourself, why is it that none of that has worked? These are not, you know, new ideas. Why hasn't that worked? And why is it that uh, in our society, somebody uh, has grown to be so callous as an individual, a relatively young individual, and he could sit there for almost nine minutes under the view of a community, of people taping him uh, and his, you know, uh, supervisor and crush the life out of this other human being. What has happened in this country over racism has uh, been as hard on us, on Black Americans, um, as it has on malforming the personalities and the values of many white people. And, you know, so many of them wind up going into the police where there is a second line. You know, you go in as a reformer, you very quickly know that if you, uh, that, that you get to tell that set, that line that's presented to us, you know, your supervisors, your brothers, sister, cops, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so it's uh, uh, it's a tough country that has been um, created. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot more happening there than just a matter of police misconduct. There's a whole environment that has made it possible for this kind of misconduct to happen and for a community to exist that's existed for many decades for, for this kind of behavior. Nicole? Aminta, it's not just about trusting the police. It's about trusting that the systems that are in place to protect communities and to care for communities are working the way they should. Mm -hmm. Communities, for instance, when you have a family member who is having, experiencing a mental health issue, you need to know that there are systems in place such that when you make a phone call, a police officer wielding a gun is not going to respond to deal with your family member. You need to have the confidence that the jurisdiction in which I live has mental health providers who are trained and who are on call. And when I make the call to say, I have a need for my family member, that's the person who's going to come out and respond. The mm -hmm. person who is qualified, who has the expertise and who knows how to help. That's the problem. It's that people can't trust that the needs that they have are going to be met. Mm -hmm that people have aren't overwhelmingly for law enforcement. The needs that people have are to be cared for, to be housed, to be fed, to be educated, to have clean water, to have safe homes. Those are the needs that people have. And people will start trusting their systems of government. Cause this is not just about law enforcement, it's our systems of government. People will start trusting them more when those needs are being met. Mm -hmm. Those are what, if you talk to people in the communities, that's what they're going to tell you they need. They're going to tell you, we don't need more guns in our communities. We don't need more police officers with tanks and other weaponry. We need support systems that allow us to live, go to work, care for our children, feed our children, and educate them. That's how you engender trust, by focusing on what the real needs are and meeting them. And that's where we've been failing. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and that is what people are talking about when we, we use the shorthand defund the police. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, just off the top of my head, I would say about nine tenths of the budgets of uh, both urban uh, and rural community police forces should be placed somewhere else. It doesn't mean that people don't have a right to be secure. 
mm -hmm. in their persons and their homes. It's just that all this other stuff, police can't do and shouldn't be called on mm -hmm. to do. And, mm -hmm. you know, we have, uh, I think also as a byproduct of racism, decided that, oh, uh, we ought to give the police as much money as possible if they can, you know, control the Black people. Mm -hmm. That's great. And I'm actually hearing too that, you know, issues of trust aren't just issues of trust for the police. They're also issues of trust for systems of education, systems of, of um, nutritional security, um, systems of, you know, water and sanitation, and that that mistrust is also there in those other systems. And a lot of the response has just been to the police and not response to other systems. But I should also point out that there's also distrust among other institutions because of the, the fact that they failed to, to provide for, for Black American communities. Mm -hmm. And we have to start seeing that accountability too, Amenta. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and let's, 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 let's go uh, to Michigan. Um, and the fact that the former governor was recently held accountable uh, for the water issue there. People mm -hmm. start seeing that if something goes wrong in one of these other areas, people are not just getting, you know, raps on, on the knuckles, mm -hmm. that actually being held accountable and that they are being made to, um, you know, to make good for the promises and the vows that they took and the oaths that they took to be government leaders. Mm -hmm. That's what people need to see. So you're right, it, 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 it means that we have to see school superintendents being held to account. We have to, be, we have to see public housing directors held for account. All of these people who play a role in the health and welfare of people's daily lives. It is not just about the police. It mm -hmm. is about the entire system of how our governments oversee, care for us, provide for us, and work with us. Mm -hmm. and, but, and I think that, you know, I mean, we got a lot of problems in terms of a lot of barriers in working these things out. And uh, let me say that I am a, have always been a strong union supporter, mm -hmm. but uh, the police unions have stood in the way of human rights in this country. Um, and um, I think we gotta find uh, some way to find, the, and somebody to find that have the courage to stand up to them. Even de Blasio, I'm sorry, uh, who <laughs> was uh, uh, to be a very uh, progressive uh, mayor, you know, very soon withered in the, in front of the objections of police unions. Mm -hmm. You just, you can't move very far unless you're willing to stand up to them. I'm sorry to say that. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, but I think it's absolutely the case. Mm -hmm. I think also there's room for solidarity in all of these respects too. I mean, I think what we saw this summer is solidarity for, um, fighting against excessive use of force, what we would say in, in international human rights language, but there's also solidarity on other things about environmental racism, about um, the right to water. I think we should also highlight that there's solidarity in these other spheres too, and these are all issues of racism as well. Absolutely. Sorry, Gay. Uh, I also wanted to say, because I, I forgot to say it earlier, but I wanted to also remind everyone that you should feel free to send your questions in the Q&A um, and we'll make sure to get them in. Um, we've been able to, to incorporate a lot of questions, so keep, so keep them coming. Sorry, Gay, did you wanna say something else on the issue of solidarity? No, no, no. no. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one of the questions that came in was um, asking each of you what your hopes are for the Biden administration when it comes to integrating civil rights and human rights, and also what should other advocates be asking for from, from the new administration? Well, I feel like we all have a very long list of <laughs> what the priorities would be. I don't know if we have enough time to list all of them, but... I mean, I guess this is kind of similar to what I said earlier in which you know, not a lot of these, you know, rights that we have accepted in the international human rights sphere, I think really should be the 
outcome of you know a lot of the policies we have here in the United States. And so you know some of the stuff that we mentioned earlier, such as you know dealing with environmental racism, access to water, you know access to housing, etc. I think that you know I would love to see more policies from the government. You know also legislation that you know really cements you know these rights, but also you know, understand the role race has and how, you know, your, you know, race really inform, you know, affects your experience in terms of your ability to enjoy a lot of these universal rights. And so, you know, I would love, you know, for policies to really establish stronger accountability for, you know, those who are, you know, play a role in perpetuating, you know, these various human rights abuses, which I guess, you know, could be considered civil rights abuses here in the United States, but also how the systems are extremely biased and how there's anti-blackness and trying to, you know, get rid of that because, uh, you know, unfortunately it's permeated in so many different um, government actions. And I think that, you know, international human rights norms can play a role in helping, you know, achieve some meaningful change. And so I guess I kind of like see it as, you know, just try to be, be very aspirational and just, you know, try to, you know, accomplish as much as possible. Mm -mm. Something that you said spoke to me too about how racism undergirds many of these different problems. And one thing that we see now that makes it completely undeniable is, is COVID-19 and the impact that that's had, that we have one out of 700 black Americans who have passed away from this pandemic and not to mention the people whose lives are just permanently affected because of their illness or the impact on their families and the trauma that communities are going through there. So one thing I would put out on my list if I could jump in is also the right to health and the right to equitable health, um, which we desperately, desperately need. You know, I mean, from the uh, point of um you know, what's happening uh, at the UN and that sort of thing is, <clears throat> uh, I don't know, you know, if people are aware that while there are now a long list of human rights treaties that both establish these rights and seek to monitor compliance with them, uh, the US has ratified only three. Mm. Um, and uh, that sends a wrong message. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would wish that the, uh, we could uh, persuade Biden-Harris to um, put forward um, more of these um, uh, treaties for ratification, mm -hmm. uh, like the uh, Economic and uh, Social Rights Covenant, which would be very key in uh, establishing a U.S. intention to recognize the right to water, the right to health care, mm. et cetera, et cetera, and to be uh, uh, asked by an international panel every two years, well, what you've done now. Mm. Um, and so um, I think that that would be an important thing. Uh, and once uh, we ratify uh, those treaties, um, well, for one thing, we get the right to have uh, an American on the treaty bodies mm -hmm. in, um, in Geneva, the role that I have been um, uh, playing. Um, and that's important too. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that, and I would also say that, you know, every country, the standard around the world has become uh, to establish national institutions of human rights uh, to, that are monitoring organizations, monitoring bodies, let's say, internal in countries that are independent uh, from government, uh, but have you know, very broad ability to monitor government and to, uh, in some cases, uh, intervene in litigation and et cetera, uh, but also to uh, come has a status at the UN that allows it to report independently 
on how the uh, government is meeting its obligations. Um, and uh, we have tried over the years, I remember we were uh, so encouraged uh, when the Obama administration uh, was uh, elected. Hmm. And a lot of people who had worked with us uh, in trying to put forward uh, the aspiration of having such a body, uh, then, you know, moved to the other side of the table. And, you know, we never heard uh, of it uh, again. It's an important thing uh, for us to, in fact, Biden today has given his first major foreign policy address preceded by an address to the uh, staff, I think, of the State Department or something like that, where he tried to say, you know, you're valued as opposed to what you were led to believe <laughs> by previous government. Mm. But, um, you know, and he promises to rejoin the international community, blah, 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 blah. This would be an important way to do that. Mm. And our US Civil Rights Commission, uh, which uh, actually was the first real job I ever had, mm. uh, but is structured to have some uh, real power, it has subpoena power by legislation, et cetera. And it has been sidelined in, uh, in um, unfortunate ways, but it could very easily be, uh, what would you say, updated hmm. to have this broader role so that it could, for example, uh, monitor the right to water uh, in this country. And uh, have played a much more critical role in the Michigan uh, water crisis. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's another thing that I would put on the list. I, I do have a long list, so I won't <laughs> bore you with the rest. <laughs> Can I add that, you know, building off of Gay's wish list, I would want, you know, with these treaties ratified, constitutional amendments recognizing these <laughs> ratifications. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and eliminating the need to prove intentional discrimination. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I could go on. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken by a true well, litigator. So let, me, let, me <laughs> say, um, let me just say, Miriam, that under us, under the uh, race convention, which the US has ratified, um, it, the, there is no need, it just, uh, you know, uh, does away with the need to prove intentionality. Uh, it's a much broader definition of racial discrimination than we have in US uh, law. But since the US has ratified it, it is part and parcel of US law under the constitution. So that's one of the things that is important to consistently uh, include in your pleadings, uh, even though uh, initially uh, judges may overlook it or, you know, poo poo it. Uh, but that's the kind of thing that I think that eventually uh, maybe grows into a reality. You know, Aminta, I think we have similar wish lists. Um, there's nothing that either Gay or Miriam have said that's not also on our Human Rights Watch li wish list. But I think our conversation about what the Biden administration, Biden Harris administration, should and needs to do would not be complete if we did not talk about the issue of reparative justice. Yes. Because it's not just about what do we need you to do in terms of you know, ratifying treaties and getting certain laws on the book and getting certain bills passed. It's about making people and communities who have suffered for hundreds of years whole again. Mm -hmm. you know, this is going to be uh, in May, it's going to be the 100th anniversary of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre. Mm -hmm. Those individuals, those descendants in that community, just as an example, as one example, have never received reparations of any kind. Mm -hmm. And you can trace the history of the degradation that these communities suffer 
back to slavery. And so my wish for them is that they be very bold dealing with reparative justice. We cannot talk about how we heal communities, how we provide more opportunities if we don't talk about how we make these communities whole again. And we need to get over this idea that reparations is about money and putting a check in people's mailboxes. It is so much greater than that. And we did a report on reparations um, just in, in, in June of, of 2020 uh, to coincide with the Juneteenth celebrations. Reparative justice is, is about so many of the issue areas that we've been talking about in this discussion. It's about putting more hospitals in communities where they are disproportionately poor and, and are filled with communities of color. It is about putting schools in communities where they are now lacking and making sure that those educational systems are up, to, are up to par. It is about a panoply of mechanisms that will ensure that communities that have suffered from generations of slavery and the ancillary issues related to slavery have an opportunity to be made whole again. That's my big wish and want for this administration because focusing on reparative justice really encompasses all of the other mechanisms that you've heard Miriam and Gay uh, articulate. Uh, that's what we need them to do and we need them to be bold and they have an opportunity. Right now there is a piece of legislation in both the House and the Senate, um, HR 40 and S 40, that calls for doing nothing more than simply putting together a commission to mm -hmm. the issue of reparations. And we're, so it, it's not about doing something specifically right now, but it's about saying, let's have a real conversation and let's bring real research to bear and look at what this can look like if we became serious about reparations, comparative justice in this country. And if for some reason the legislation doesn't move forward, as we hope, um, President Biden has the power of the pen through mm -hmm. executive action to put together this very same kind of commission and start to study this issue. So we want to see that kind of boldness. Mm -hmm. we Lots of nice, wonderful conversations in the past, but we really now have to actually start seeing actions that are grounded in a recognition that race has been the cancer that has permeated this society and this democracy for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, this brings up two uh, points uh, for me, if I, I may. I mean, one is, um, um, uh, yes, I uh, uh, thoroughly, completely agree with Nicole. And I might say we have now have a sister vice president mm -hmm. who initially ran for president uh, and part of her platform was uh, reparations and HR 40, mm -hmm. uh, supporting HR 40. So I think there's a basis for pushing that into some sort of reality. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, it brings me to another point, which is, um, you know, I worked on the Tulsa riots case uh, with uh, Charles Ogletree, mm -hmm. and uh, which we uh, took all the way to the Supreme Court. And then um, I took the lead in taking it to the uh, International Inter-American Commission on human rights. And, um, you know, it was the, the, the commission granted uh, a hearing where the US uh, did appear uh, and argue, you know, with us before uh, the commission. Uh, actually, it was great because uh, some of the survivors uh, that were still alive uh, were uh, with us, they were named plaintiffs as uh, they had to be. So, but uh, the bottom line is this. Okay, so what happened? We made a, a, a great set of arguments. Um, and so when the US ran out of defenses, <laughs> if you will, to argue, uh, they uh, turned to threats. Mm -hmm. And their uh, threats were to the commission uh, mm -hmm. to say, look, this is a very uh, useful body that's played a very important role. But if you grant this, uh, that useful role will be over. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and, uh, you know, this is not a one-time uh, situation. Of course, they, you know, for them, we didn't hear <laughs> from the commission, I guess. But, <laughs> but uh, same thing with the George Floyd initiative. Mm. You know, when we got it before the council uh, and the Africa group was pushing it forward, the uh, U.S. Uh, mission and the State Department resorted to threats uh, uh, to uh, governments going directly to ca their capitals and threatening them, uh, threatening their aid packages because we got Africa group to uh, move it forward, most vulnerable, unfortunately, of, of all of the groups of, of governments. Um, and I think that one of the things that I would ask uh, Biden-Harris as they re-enter uh, the uh, international community is that they go with the, the, with the, the level of humility that says, yes, uh, we have made mistakes hmm. and um, it's okay, you know, call us out on it, hmm. even in this uh, forum. Um, that, that, that's a big thing hmm. because it means that um, the U.S. will gain a level of uh, capital, <laughs> yeah, how does it, with other governments. That would be now. This is this to me would be the source of great solidarity between us and other civil society groups around the world struggling. That you know the uh, U.S. government now says yes, even us mm -hmm. call us out on our mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, that is, I think, a uh, that 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 would be a biggie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And that speaks back to the question of the potential for human rights and, and what it can bring. I mean, this level of openness to scrutiny would really um, change the way that we see the US and the way that we, we see ourselves. Um, I know that we have a little bit over uh, 10 minutes left. Um, I wanted to ask one question on um, resilience and inspiration because this is something that we talk about often in our clinic. Um, we know that doing the work of human rights, um, both domestically and internationally involves, you know, taking on the pain of communities and, and really pushing for justice and sometimes coming against these barriers that are frustrating and, and maybe discouraging. So I'm wondering from each of you, maybe um, before you close, if you have a final statement and you want to include that as well, please go ahead. But also wondering, you know, where do you get your, your inspiration from and, and what can other students and um, you know, uh, emerging activists and ac advocates um, think about as, as sources of inspiration for when they, when they join this, um, when they join this field. I'd love for Miriam to go first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so I would say for me, my main inspiration is the communities I work with. I, you know, I'm just constantly in awe of just the dedication to advocacy and how communities have mobilized to really fight against, you know, some pressing human rights issues that they have to live with, you know, constantly. Um, you know, I often reflect on my privilege as an attorney and how I'm able to, you know, physically remove myself from, you know, a particular human rights issue in a way that a lot of the communities I work with are unable to, and the fact that they keep on going is, you know, a constant inspiration for me. And I think that this has definitely been more applicable as I shifted from working more internationally to working with communities in the United States in which I have a shared identity and they look like me. And that I think adds another degree of difficulty to doing this work because of you know the shared trauma and also the constant reminder of the role racism plays in a lot of these serious human rights abuses in the United States. And so, you know, I think, you know, really orienting myself, uh, you know, and looking to what 
communities are doing has helped me a lot in grounding myself. Mm. And I think it's important to, you know, to, to acknowledge this and to be open with yourself and the others that you're working with who are part of your support system of, you know, trying to manage these, this emotionally tolling work. I think that mm. a lot of times we're encouraged to kind of just internalize it and to just keep on going and, you know, I think there's a bit of a romanticism of martyrdom in the human rights field that I think we need to get away from. And I think, you know, I, I think it's, it sounds simple, but I think just, you know, really being re honest with yourself and taking time when you need to. Great. Very useful. Thank you, Maria. Well, I'll jump in, Gay. Um, like Miriam, I, I'm grounded in why I do this work. Mm -hmm. I always try to return to the purpose for why I get up every day to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I decided when I was an eighth grader in junior high that I wanted to be a civil and human rights attorney mm -hmm. because I saw people who looked like me, who lived in communities like mine being mistreated. I didn't have the education at that point as a 13 year old or the vocabulary to talk about, um, you know, disfranchisement, economic inequality, disparities. I wasn't that sophisticated yet, but I was smart enough to know that people being treated differently because of the way they looked and where they lived and how much money they had in the bank was wrong and was a problem. Mm -hmm. That's what motivated me then. And that's what continues to motivate me now. It's always thinking about the people whom we are helping to give voice to, people that we are standing behind and whom through our work we are helping to empower because it's about their stories. It's about their communities and their needs. And that's what keeps me grounded and helps me to keep going each and every day. And like Miriam said, we are privileged. How dare I complain about, you know, I didn't get enough sleep last night when there are people who cannot feed their babies, who do not have heat and who do not have clean water. So all of those things keep me going. And I also know how important it is for people who do have, as Miriam said, shared experiences and shared backgrounds to be at the, on the front lines of doing this work. Mm -hmm. It matters when you have people that look like you, who live like you, who have shared experiences just like you, who can speak truth to power. And then the other thing I would say is, it's important for all of us to surround ourselves with a support system that is full of truth tellers. Hmm. People who will tell you um, when, you're, when you're screwing up. <laughs> <laughs> Not just, you know, the people who will say all the nice things I'm into that you said about us at the beginning that makes you sound like <laughs> all warm water because we don't. <laughs> But the people who will say, you, you better get it together. Um, here's where you need to be. Here's where you need to be speaking out. That's what keeps us all strong and keeps us all going, having those people in our corner and also being that for one another. You know, mm -hmm. from this panel, like we have a sister circle and we do mm -hmm. lots of sister circles that overlap. And those circles, whether they be sister circles or other circles, are what you have to have in your life and you have to surround yourself with because those will be the people who remind you why you're doing what you do and why it's important and why you can't stop, but who will mm -hmm. remind you to take a minute to also care for yourself because if you're not caring for yourself, how can you care for others? Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Gay, I give you the final word. <laughs> oh, well, I don't know that I, I have anything uh, more final than those beautiful words uh, by Miriam and, and Nicole. Um, I, you know, I as well, you know, I told somebody, somebody asked me, well, how can you live your life in refugee camps around the world? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's right at the point where, uh, you know, people are being um, extremely um, uh, oppressed, where, you know, I find uh, the greatest, uh, the people who inspire me the most mm -hmm. 
um, and who I enjoy being with hmm. um, and who I find a community uh, with. Um, and it's not to say that, you know, this is a, a, bit, a lot of work. It's yeah. not, uh, you know, just kumbaya with the, our buddies. Um, at least, you know, uh, uh, all four of us I work hard at being professionals. And that's one of the things that I, I you know, really uh, very much dedicated myself to, not just caring about these issues, not just caring about my community, but also um, becoming, uh, gaining the tools uh, with which to fight the, you know, best fight, the greatest fight. Um, and so, you know, it's a lot of work mm -hmm. um, and um, it's, uh, it, it drains you. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I actually want to say thank you to my younger sisters because in my era, we never talked about this. Mm -hmm. You know, it was not a, a something that uh, was a major concern uh, as other issues uh, were, but uh, I did always see people dropping out along the way. Mm. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, you, you, you take that as a lesson. Uh, mm. So thank you uh, for making this a, a consistent issue that mm. you're mm. And thank you all. I mean, I think I also get my inspiration from other advocates just because there are many of us, like Nicole said, there are many sister circles, there are many um, circles of advocates who have inspired us along the way. We can call each other and ask, Gay, what do you, what do you think about this? Can you, can you give me some of your wisdom? And, and that helps me as well. Know how to navigate when you're exhausted, when you're frustrated, and, and also to find new tools that you can use to, to push for justice because there's nothing more disempowering than not being able to do something. Um, and being able to do something is also a way to, to, to self-sustain. So with that, I'm gonna say um, thank you to all of the panelists for this very, very um, rich discussion. Um, I, I'm just grateful for all of you for giving your time, your precious insights to this panel. Um, I look forward to having continued conversations um, on this topic as, as we continue the series. Um, and I want to name each of you, um, Nicole Austin Hillary, thank you so much. Um, Miriam Jordan, um, another <laughs> classmate of mine, um, Gay, uh, thank you for your time. And I also want to thank all of the co-sponsoring organizations, the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice, HLS Advocates for Human Rights, who are already doing their advocacy, even as law students, um, the Harvard Civil Rights Civil Liberties Law Review, and all of our friends from the Harvard Human Rights Journal. Thank you, everyone, um, for, this, for this great, rich discussion. You're welcome, Lisa. Keep up the good work. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.